So welcome everybody. This is another action-packed episode of the Journal of Lifestyle Medicine podcast. I'm Sven Hosford. And uh, what I'm going to do with this podcast, we're going to start a new series. We're going to go and do a little throwback Thursday on whatever day it is. It's going to be our uh, step into the Wayback Machine uh, to remember Point of Light. If you lived in Pittsburgh between 1994 and 2009, you and if you had an interest in holistic health and spirituality or other kinds of esoteric healing, you may have stumbled across our magazine in uh, different places like health food stores, yoga studios, and your favorite incense emporium. Now, being the publisher of this magazine helped shape both my publishing career, my professional career, and also helped shape my understanding of the deepest secrets of the universe. I'm not just blowing smoke here. I'm not making that up. I got to interview local and national leaders in holistic health and spiritual growth and alternative medicine, plus a man that walked on the moon and a Super Bowl athlete. That's two different people. Now, this podcast series will revisit some of the best interviews that I recorded for articles and for podcasts. Some of them have been on podcasts before. Some of them have never been heard. One of my favorite interviews was with a guy named Steve Behrman. He was also known as Swami Beyondananda. Now, those of us who published these kinds of magazines back in the day, uh, we covered issues of spirituality and sustainability and taking responsibility for your own wellness, and often in the face of deadly diseases. These topics are tedious, heady, and sometimes even a little bit dull, to be honest. And we could always uh, rely upon the Swami to swoop in and help us remember that full realization is just as important as full realization. His opinionated advice columns were a regular palate cleanser to the dreary self-importance of some of the new age philosophies that we had to cover. Now in 2000, in the year 2000, uh, with the new century and the, remember that, presidential election, what happened there, the Swami sharpened his skewers on the electile dysfunction that ran amok, still running amok today, apparently, Uh, but we got this, this was a solid clue that underneath that silly outer demeanor, there there lay a keen intellect. So with the publication of Spontaneous Evolution in 2009, the Swami revealed himself to be Steve Behrman, And he and Bruce Lipton, who also wrote The Biology of Belief, wrote this brilliant book called Spontaneous Evolution. It's just absolutely fantastic. It's it's a look at the new edge science and just what the heck are we supposed to do with it. So from 2009, here's my interview with Steve Behrman. Welcome, Swami. Steve Behrman. Well, thank you. Uh, both uh, the Swami is here, just in case you need to talk to good, him. He's good. hovering above <laughs> on the magic carpet, and uh, you know, uh, at, if need be, I will channel him. And otherwise, uh, as of right now, he is channeling me. Okay. <laughs> well, I have to tell you that uh, uh, you know, over the years, I've used one of your lines to help break the ice at parties. You know, when people find out what I do for a living, they we often get into this conversation about, well, I think I've had psychic experiences, and I have to explain that everyone, everyone is a mystic, but there are two types of mystics, and you have your pessimistics and your optimistics. You remember how the rest of this goes? Yeah, well, actually, you know, the fact is that uh, that the pessimistics are very much in touch with reality, but the optimistics are happier and live longer. <laughs> and, of course, uh, the pessimistics are the ones who are telling us the sky is falling, and the optimistics say, no, it only looks that way because we are ascending. Exactly. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's now, all a matter of perspective. It's all a matter of perspective. And now you call that the great upwising? Yes, the, yes, because uh, there are great changes happening on this planet, uh, as Bruce and I talk about in Spontaneous Evolution. And in order for us to really uh, evolve uh, and achieve what the Swami would call to manifest destiny, to manifest our destiny as a species, we have to participate, and part of that involves waking up and wising up, and the upwising is what's going on. And this is going to bring about a new American evolution. 
Yeah. I mean, revolution is when things go around in circles. And, you know, uh, as the Swami would say, if you find yourself on a vicious cycle, stop pedaling. <laughs> so here we are. We uh, Rather than this revolution that just keeps turning in on itself, evolution is a um, emergent integration of what was formerly polarities into a holistic uh, unity. Mm. And, and that's really, uh, really the key thing is that uh, balancing of the of the polarities and the dichotomies and the paradoxes uh, that exist in our life. Well, you know, we do have these. Uh, we call them dueling dualities in the book, and of course, in terms of uh, the dominant belief systems, uh, lowest common dominator belief systems, <laughs> we have uh, scientific in this corner religious <laughs> fundamentalism weighing fifty. You know that, and on the other corner we have scientific. Materialism, which in itself can be as dogmatic as religion. Absolutely. And so we have these two dueling belief systems. One is saying that we are the subject of a vengeful God. The other is saying that we are subject of a random universe. Neither of those giving us very much power. Neither one. And so in this new uh, understanding that uh, Bruce has helped, uh, helped bring through his work in evolutionary biology, we now are coming to the understanding that Spirit uh, and the matter are intertwined and intertangled. It's the same conversation. And that uh, science is now saying the same things that our spiritual teachers have been trying to tell us for millennia, which is uh, we are really all in this together. And there, there is really only one, and we are all one with that same one. Yeah. It, it really is astonishing over the last, uh, just the last decade, how much science has caught up now with, with mysticism, the old-fashioned mysticism. You know, interestingly, you know, uh, Einstein, uh, was, it was over 100 years ago that Einstein came up with his notion that we live in a universe of uh, relationships. And yet our political system and our medical system is still very Newtonian, dealing with mm -hmm. equal and opposite forces, uh, linear symptoms rather than the uh, entanglement of this whole system called the human body or the universe. Right. And so uh, as we are coming, becoming more and more aware of what the quantum physicists are telling us, which is that underneath all of this matter is merely energy, and that uh, matter is, uh, in a certain sense, uh, created by energy. When you, when you get down to the subatomic level, um, it's only energy. Yeah, that's all there is. Yeah. All there is is energy and intention. Energy and intention, and that's really the key because, uh, as Bruce Lipton uh, wrote about in this book, Biology Belief, which I highly recommend you go read as well, um, it's not our biology, uh, it's not our, our, um, our physiology that determines our biological um, destiny, but the thoughts and beliefs that we have that control what goes <laughs> on inside the cell. So, uh, as, as one physicist said, and you know, this is somebody who's coming from purely a position of science, you know, not a spiritual person at all. He said that the best way to describe the universe is it's a thought. It's a thought. Mm. And thought provides the field that rearranges the matter. Well, you know, I tried to slug through the self aware universe by Amit Goswami. And I got to tell you, oh, go Swami, go! That's our slogan. <laughs> <laughs> go, go Swami! I, yeah, no, we've he's... cheered him on. We've been cheering him on for for ten years now. He he is brilliant, but man, it's it's a dense book, and your book is just a breath of fresh air. You get you get to to laugh, and you get to think, and if you could just make people cry, you know, you'd be a triple threat. Well, it's a heavy book. It might drop on your toe. That's right. <laughs> It's good, it's good in a fight. <laughs> it's good in a fight. You know, it reminds me, many, many years ago, um, I had a chance to do a program with Dr. Benjamin Spock, who wrote the Baby and Child Care book, you know, mm -hmm. uh, which many of us who grew up in the post-war years were raised with. And at, at that time, he was over 90 years old. And on my, my aunt suggested I do this. This wasn't my original idea, but she goaded me to do it. So I, I went up to him and I said, you know, when I was a young child, my mother found your book hugely helpful. He said, really? I said, yeah. She used to spank me with it all the time. 
<laughs> did, he, did he laugh? Of course he laughed. Okay, he, was a, he, was a, he was pretty fun at that point. Well, I do want to get into uh, some of the points you make in here, um, you know, and the whole idea that the evolution itself is evolving, which I think is fascinating. But tell us uh, first a little bit about your background. Uh, what was your early adult life uh, like? And, and uh well, I, I spent my deformative years in, uh, <laughs> in, in Brooklyn, which which accounts for the for the humor. But my early career was in alternative education. I I was teaching in Washington D.C. and started an alternative high school, uh, which was quite an amazing uh, project. You know, my my partner and I at that time uh, we didn't know what we couldn't do, so exactly. consequently we went and started a school. And then we ended up writing a book uh, published by Simon & Schuster. But one of the things I discovered in these very heady revolutionary days in the late 60s and early 70s is that there was a gap between the talk and the walk. Mm -hmm. And I remember uh, one of the, I met somebody who was apparently a world-renowned expert on communal living, except nobody could stand to live with them. <laughs> minor problem. And so I really, uh, as I noticed all of these discrepancies between the ideal and the real deal, I embarked on a journey of my own in psychology and spirituality and so on, and trying to understand how it is that we human beings actually can evolve and actually can um, achieve uh, our species destiny and uh, be uh, you know create a world that's uh, that's healthier and happier and for a number of years as a as a political scientist uh, and also somebody exposed to holistic medicine i uh, imagined writing a book called healing the body politic which would talk about the um, you, which would use the uh, holistic medical metaphor to discuss this whole system called politics mm -hmm. and uh about four and a half years ago, a mutual friend introduced me to Bruce Lipton, and we became friends, and we just began a conversation about biology and politics. And mm -hmm. after a while, it became clear that this was the person I was supposed to work with. Mm -hmm. and so mm -hmm. uh, we embarked on a three-and-a-half-year journey to, uh, to write this book. Uh, and uh, again, it's a it's a way of weaving a new story, creating the foundation for a new story, yeah. um, which weaves biology and physics and fractal mathematics with politics, economics, spirituality, and psychology. So that uh, our our intention is to create this whole cloth, holistic notion of how spirit and science are really saying the same thing and offering us an operating system for success on the planet, mm. which is essentially uh, recognizing that in every evolution uh, there is an expansion of um, community and awareness. And that was true when the single-cell organisms combined to become multi-cell organisms, and we are, you and me and everybody listening, as a multicellular organism consisting of upwards of 50 trillion cells. Mm -hmm. And um, this system seems to be working just fine. The cells are operating in concert. They're cooperating. They're balancing successfully the negative uh, you know, toxins. We call them sociopathogens in the body politic. And, uh, and doing just fine. And uh, well, the system is working extraordinarily well. We have uh, under our skins, we have full employment. We have universal health care. Hmm. We have no cell left behind. Mm -hmm. You know, the liver and the pancreas are actually uh, cooperating, not fighting with one another. You never hear about the liver invading the pancreas, demanding the islets of Langerhans. Uh, <laughs> and so we have a wonderful role model for, um, for a coherent and healthy system underneath our skin, and the exciting evolutionary news is that the next phase of human evolution, should we choose to uh, participate, is the understanding and living as if we are all and each cells in the body of, an, of a new organism called humanity. And this, I think that's an amazing comparison, and you do a great job of really explaining how these single-celled organisms had to create community, had to work in concert in order to create a body. And in that same way, human beings must work in concert in order to create this 
body of humanity or the body of the planet, the Gaia principle. Yeah, and what's really interesting is that every organism has what's called a central voice. In other words, you and I have an organizing principle that makes us us, that pulls this um, confluence, uh, this community of 50 trillion cells together to work together and to listen to one common signal. And we, uh, you and I and the people who are listening, uh, are probably uh, part of the group that uh, Paul Ray has termed cultural creatives, mm-hmm. the people who are beginning to tune into this fact that the cell, the individual, the community, humanity, and the planet itself are really one part, a uh, part of one living ecosystem, and that what's good for one is good for all. And in this uh, in this growing realization. Uh, the so-called cultural creatives uh, could be likened to the uh, imaginal cells of the butterfly developing as the caterpillar falls apart mm-hmm. in the in the cocoon. And uh, we can look at caterpillar society falling apart around us. We can look at the economic system, the so-called healthcare system, the educational system, all of these systems which are really... Um, uh, not doing very well and falling apart. And rather than trying to patch up systems that are fundamentally flawed because they represent an old paradigm, I mean, you're not going to go, hey, let's go fix the caterpillar. Come on, you know. And mm-hmm. instead, we want to actually uh, empower the butterfly to be born. And that's what this book is uh, has been written to do, to help people create um, a coherent foundational story for a holistic and integrated worldview that which w- that will allow this new butterfly organism to uh, mm. to, to form, and you, and you do that so well. Your your first um, your first part of the book is it reminds me of the old fire sign theater bit. Uh, everything you know is wrong. We we stole it. From I, I bet you did. Yeah, I thought you had. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> and and then you go on to uh, the four myths of the apocalypse. Which uh, I love that the the four myths of the apocalypse. If these are ideas that you want to uh, put a stake in, I guess. And, and yes, we somehow... we have a great stake in putting a stake <laughs> through a, the, yeah. the heart of the the four pillars. Uh, you know the the four pillars of uh, scientific materialism, our current paradigm, our our current dogmatic belief system. And let, once we once we put a stake in each one of these, we can call a hearse for each one, and then we, of course, have the four hearses of the apocalypse. Ah, very uh, good. <laughs> see, see? I'm not trying to out-swami the swami here now. But, uh... <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, good. We got it. We got it. Obviously, the farce field has spread all the way to Pittsburgh, and, and these jokes are naturally forming on their own. Uh, yeah, and I want to say something about these, these beliefs. Uh, uh, briefly, and again, we go into great detail in the book, mm-hmm. briefly, the four pillars of scientific materialism. Number one, only matter matters, that only the physical world is real. Now, there are people out there who believe that only the physical world is real, mm-hmm. despite the evidence that the uh, that the physical world is an illusion created by energy and thought. The second belief system is the belief in the... Um, survival of the fittest, and evolutionary science is now telling us that uh, systems evolve as a whole system. So mm. it's really the thrival of the fittingest, and mm. as we've been, we humans have been so busy trying to figure out which one of us most fit individuals will be at the pop, top of the food pile, we, uh, we may be flunking third dimension as a species. <laughs> You know, our, so it's really our species fitness that's being reckoned right now. And the third belief is the notion that um, we are controlled by ourselves, by our genetic destiny. You know, it's a very interesting uh, study done. You know how often um, the uh, scientists have shown that disease patterns seem to run in families, which would indicate that there is a genetic component to just certain diseases. Well, what's just very, very interesting is that these disease patterns also extend to children adopted into those families. Mm. So there's something else at work. There's some kinds of fields of belief. uh, And just because we can't see certain patterns doesn't mean those patterns don't exist. Mm -hmm. We haven't figured out those patterns yet, right? Wow. 
you know, just as uh, when we were kids in science class, the science teacher would take a bunch of iron filings and drop them on a piece of paper, and they would just fall there. But when a magnet was placed under that piece of paper, lo and behold, the iron filings would arrange themselves in a pattern. And uh, if if we hadn't known about magnetism, we'd go, wow, those are some extraordinarily intelligent iron filings. Mm-hmm. So we are we are becoming more and more aware of these patterns that impact our matter from outside the cell. And many of these patterns are thought patterns and belief patterns. And and the final um, the final misperception, the final um, pillar that's been disproved by science is the entire notion of random evolution. Evolution is life's continuing conscious and aware learning process. And uh, as every stage of evolution seems to have the same repeating patterns of increasing awareness and increasing community. And in, con- in contradiction to some of the basic principles, in fact, it's, they call it the central dogma, of Darwinism, um, learned behaviors can become part of the genetic code in a rather qu- rather quickly. Uh, in 1988, uh, there was an experiment done relatively recently where bacteria were put into a field of something that they could not digest. And in this, uh, this state of, uh, of distress and danger, the bacteria begin this very, very rapid mutation process. And at some point, just as you or I might brainstorm the answer to a question, the bacteria would somehow randomly and mistakenly create the genetic, uh, the gene that would allow them to make the protein to digest what they're in. And at that point, that gene becomes part of their genetic pool, and that strain of bacteria can now live in and survive in and thrive in that environment. And so since that time, uh, we've been using uh, bacteria to digest oil spills because of their mm. ability to reproduce and to mutate very rapidly. Well, this goes against the entire idea of Darwinian evolution that suggests that uh, you know uh, an infinite number of monkeys on an infinite number of typewriters could come up with the words of uh, the works of Shakespeare. Mm-hmm. It kind of reminds me of this Woody Allen thing that I saw, you know, where the monkeys are working and they, finally they get to be or not to be. That is the glork blum 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 blum. blum. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it, it, and this is really what I said earlier. The evolution of evolution is that we now understand that evolution not only is it not random that it has a consciousness behind it, but it also happens very quickly at times, and there's these huge quantum leaps. Yeah, it's called punctuated equilibrium, where things are stable for quite a while, and then when there's a huge disturbance in the uh, environment, like a uh, a body from outer space hitting the Earth, mm-hmm. then there's all of a sudden very, very rapid uh, mutation and evolution in order for these organisms to adapt. And uh, interestingly, scientists say that we are now experiencing the sixth great extinction. And unlike the other five, which uh, involve uh, things from outer space, this um, this current extinction uh, is caused by residue from inner space, <laughs> from our own psyches and, and faulty belief systems. And our species... Um, is uh, definitely at the top of the endangering species list, and yeah. consequently the endangered species list as well. Mm. Well, we we got off on a a little bit of a tangent, but I I, w- I did want to cover this. The one chapter I found absolutely fascinating um, was the whole chapter on the story of stories, and, ah, yeah. and how uh, the the people who get to be the official truth sayers of society can answer the three basic questions. Can you give us the three basic questions? Yeah, the, the three basic questions are, uh, how did we get here? Why are we here? And now that we're here, how do we make the best of it? Right. And we've gone through, you know, it's very interesting, I just went to a very uh, amazing conference uh, this past weekend called Science and Non-Duality, and one of the speakers mm. was uh, an individual who had gone through many, many shamanic initiations uh, and has put himself, I mean, 
in a certain sense, he's no longer there. There's somebody else there instead, hmm. and he's uh, had body piercings and all kinds of experiences. And he was the first person that I've ever heard who was able to uh, speak lucidly about uh, indigenous culture, the animism, where really you're one with everything, mm-hmm. and there's no distinction between life and death. There's no distinction between you and me. There's no distinction between spirit and matter. And all of human life began that way. We be- we began, our cultures began as animistic cultures, sort of like the Garden of Eden, mm-hmm. sort of like being an infant and not yet understanding the separateness of you and me. Mm-hmm. And then from there, we evolved into polytheism, uh, the worshiping of a multiplicity of gods, uh, each of each of which represent the elements that we find. And, and so like a young child uh, exploring the world and finding these many fascinating forces that can't be explained, um, we attributed these to, to various gods. And then we came to the point where uh, we adopted monotheism, which is the idea of there's one god, and uh, in a certain sense, this was an authoritarian god. This was the, you know, like children, uh, let's say ages 7 to 12, where they want to know what the rules are. They want to know, mm-hmm. what, what do I have to do here to, uh, to fit in? Tell me how things work. Right. And so we had that top-down uh, thou shalt and thou shalt not kind of thing. Uh, and we must have the, the fear of being smited in order to keep it. Oh, alive. yes, that uh, was a smitey fear was... that we had. <laughs> uh, and, and then, of course, uh, with the with the uh, scientific revolution, the Renaissance, um, the um, Protestant Reformation, uh, the age of Descartes and Newton and Fran- Sir Francis Bacon, we ushered in uh, scientific materialism, which was uh, for the first time, uh, an objective view of the material world and uh, to the Newtonians uh, and to Descartes, the universe was a machine. And you have some you have some fascinating uh, graphs in there that kind of explain this uh, this period that we just talked about from animism up through the Reformation and right to 1776 as our human beings kind of foray into the world of spirit, where spirit matters more than matter. And, yeah, and we slowly and, come back to that place at 1776, where we're back into balance again. Yeah, 1776, and we look at uh, what was happening right around that time. Interestingly, America's founding fathers were greatly influenced, uh, you know, by the Hermetic traditions brought brought down through the Masonic tradition, uh, through the Rosicrucians, and so on. And at the same time, they were greatly influenced by the Iroquois nation, mm-hmm. and so many of the uh, uh, the features of our of our governmental system, balance of powers, for example, is something that came from the Iroquois nation. Now, the one thing that the founding fathers could not quite bring themselves to adopt that the Iroquois nation uh, used successfully was something called the Council of Grandmothers. Mm. And the Council of Grandmothers... Uh, was essentially that the you know the elder women in the tribe were the ones who had the final say as to whether the tribe went to war or not. They could impeach the old chief if uh, if he uh, for malfeasance, and they could also appoint a new chief. But somehow Franklin and Washington and Jefferson and gang, you know, they couldn't quite wrap themselves around having Martha and Betsy and Abigail. Um, having the final say as to what happened. Mm. And so um, we took this system in this country, you know, and, and again, 1776, if you look at the, uh, at the, at the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and, and all, of the, um, all of the work that the founders of America did, you really see there's such a terrific balance between the practical and the spiritual. Mm-hmm. And here, uh, in, in the, uh, you know, the practical aspects of running a country and creating a, a democracy and so on, or creating a republic anyway, um, there was really so much, uh, spiritual infusion. Um, most of the founding fathers would have called themselves deists. Right. Um, which is to say, um, the very, very short form is, um, believing more in, uh, a unifying spirit 
that also encompasses nature than believing in the traditional religion. Now, all of them uh, were, uh, quote-unquote, religious individuals. Uh, but if you... Uh, but if you really look closely, you see that the um, that Washington, for example, was a was deeply spiritual. His his spirituality was very personal and private. But because he had to communicate with other individuals in that society, naturally the form that it took was uh, was the Christian religion. Mm -hmm. uh, same with Jefferson. Jefferson wrote something called Jeff Jefferson's Bible. And if you read Jefferson's contention in the Bible, in his version of the Bible, you see that it's very much like the um, the true uh, work and beliefs of Jesus, as opposed to the you know current run of fundamentalists who are saying we're going to heaven and you can go to hell. Mm -hmm. So we see that level of enlightenment. But then, as you as as we say in that chapter the pendulum or the wave or the sine wave began to move into the domain of exper experimenting and experiencing more of the material world. Right. And, you know, just as we move from childhood to adolescence, you know, the adolescent wants to be independent, the adolescent is indestructible, the adolescent wants to explore the physical world. And, you know, we see that the ultimate in adolescent arrogance is this entire notion of God is dead and that only matter exists. Mm -hmm. And in fact, um, you know, Lord Kelvin, who was a great scientist uh, before the turn of last century, uh, in, in the 1890s, he wrote that, well, you know, we pretty much know everything there is to know about physics, and now uh, all we need is just better measurements. <laughs> you know, and then a funny thing happened on the way to absolute certainty. You know, we had the, uh, you know, the discovery of the atom. We had discovery of radiation, and um, you know, we have uh, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, which yeah. says uh, that um, you know, when you when you observe an object, you change the object by observing it. You change right. its location. Right. And uh, the latest in, in some of the wild, wild, uh, way out there physics that actually many physicists are, act, are, are subscribing to is that everything exists all the time, so there's no such thing as past, present, present and future. Right. So there's no death. I mean, we're always here. Right. Uh, but reality exists on a need-to-exist basis, mm -hmm. that we, we pick and choose what we need in order to, so that we're not doing everything at the same time. I mean, think about how unpleasant it would be to, yeah. uh, you know, read, eat, go to the bathroom, and make love all at once. So it just wouldn't work. Yeah, I guess not. <laughs> Thanks for that visual image. No, we won't even. <laughs> Fortunately, this is audio, so no right, to right. visualize. Well, yeah, and I've heard it expressed. Uh, one of my one of my friends is. Um, uh, Greg Nicosia, who's the president of the uh, association, uh, I'm sorry, the um, Comprehensive Energy Psychology Association, and uh, he is basically talks about thought as a 10 to 12 dimensional construct. Yeah, and that all we pretty much understand now that all thought exists everywhere, all at the same time. Mm -hmm. and that we, there's one mind in the universe, and we all share it. Yeah. Yeah, and and, and, it, and it's it's actually my, a mind warping thought. You can't even get your mind around that thought. Yeah, and so here we are. Uh, and interestingly enough, um, this next phase of evolution requires that we begin to allow that paradox to exist. And as we do that, we come to recognize that so many of the structures that we've created. And mistaken for reality are really limiting beliefs. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, this, I'd like to, to riff on this for a minute. Now, you, I've had this sense, uh, and many people have had this sense over the last, especially this last decade, that the veil is getting thinner and thinner and thinner. And, you know, all of this hype around 2012 and all this sort of thing, it seems to me and to some other people that what we're moving towards is a complete elimination of the veil where telepathy will be the standard mode of communication. And if you just... just you know, I knew you were going to say that. Yeah. yeah. 
I didn't say precognition, no. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me, let me, you know, there's a very interesting thing we mentioned in the book in regards to precognition. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dean Radin uh, at the Institute of Noetic Sciences has been conducting some very interesting experiments. And one of the, uh, I'll just go into this very briefly because there's a lot of stuff that we report in the book about it, but um, uh, in this one particular uh, experiment, uh, he shows people these uh, a slideshow, and most of the photos are beautiful and nature and peaceful and smiling children and puppy dogs and so on. But every now and then, there is a disturbing image of sex or violence or something that's sharply in contrast to that. And as we might expect, uh, the individual watching that slideshow has a uh, a visceral and measurable uh, reaction to it, measured by uh, the galvanic skin response and other other means of uh, noting responses. But what's very interesting is that this physiological response comes a couple of seconds before the image mm. is shown. Hmm. So somehow, hmm. this uh, we've got this this entire notion of time as an absolute. Maybe that's what 2012 is. Maybe 2012 is the you know when you say the lifting of the veils, uh, you know the uh, the definition of apocalypse is lifting of the veils. Hmm. So maybe what we look at as apocalyptic, if we're not so fearful about it, is lifting the veils on these mysteries such as time. Uh, and some of the various other forms of um, of separation that we have learned ourselves into accepting. Right. You know, how many people? And I know that there's people out there out there listening or reading this who will know that they they've known people, or maybe it was true of themselves that when they were children, they were able to see auras. They were able to. They had psychic experiences of one kind or another. And in so many people, unless you you came from a family where this was accepted and encouraged, so many people had these abilities extinguished uh, simply by a look that said, "We don't do that. Mm-hmm. That is that's outside the permissible boundaries." Mm-hmm. And so um, we are now at a point where so many of these, uh, you know, again, the lifting of the veils. So many uh, secrets, so many spiritual uh, secrets that had been uh, kept under wraps because of the implications and because of the tendency that less conscious human beings have to misuse power uh, are now being liberated. You know, there's something now called open source religion. You know, mm-hmm. where some of these, um, um, you know, ancient practices and techniques are being revealed. And notes are being compared, and people uh, in the Celtic traditions are finding, well, you know, the Tibetan Buddhists have been doing this too. Mm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, you know, that there's some very, very common um, uh, roots of, uh, of spiritual practice and spiritual truth that date back prior to recorded civilization. Yeah. So the lifting of the veils um, that you're talking about, and perhaps what 2012 is about, is um, two things, I think. First of all, it's liberating these um, our connections, you know, that you know, these things that have kept us separated, these walls coming down, the veils of separation between us coming down. And simultaneously, you know, the end of time might indicate the end of the old story. Yeah. The end of the old story of uh, victims and villains. Right. And, uh, you know, and, you know, free of that story, you know, if we're not burdened by these old stories, if you did this to me, and you did this to me, and I did this to you, um, in a, it's not, it's not, it's simple, but it's not easy, in a ceremony of forgiveness, in a context of forgiveness and release, what would it, what would happen if we no longer had to live these old stories? Yeah. What could we be doing instead? Oh, yeah. Well, it, it, to get back to my question, if we're all telepathic, what professions are no longer necessary if you don't have to be protected <laughs> against people lying to you? Well, well, you know, very interestingly, um, 
one of the one of the books that I read in preparation for doing this book and doing this work uh, was called Miracles of Mind by Russell Targ. And Russell is a physicist who worked at the Stanford Research Institute. And back in the uh, back in the seventies, there were some very very interesting experiments done. Um, by the Stanford Research Institute on behalf of the CIA uh, called remote viewing mm -hmm. experiments. Mm -hmm. And uh, in, in these experiments, uh, people would learn to cultivate their psychic powers so that they could see behind walls, that they could look at, the, in this case, Soviet military installations across the planet. Right. And, uh, and these were highly accurate. And in fact... Um, one of the people um, who was one of the most adept at this uh, was a guy named Pat Price, and he had been the police chief in some city. I don't think it was Pittsburgh, but I think it was a it was a midwestern city. He was a police chief, mm -hmm. and he, you know, had this uh, had this sense, and you know, through the techniques that they taught, was able to. Uh, become very adept at this remote viewing. Hmm. I, I had the uh, opportunity to interview uh, Edgar Mitchell, who founded the Institute of Noetic Sciences, and uh, he said that uh, when he, you know, we first got into the whole study of all of this, he could ta teach any eight-year-old to do remote viewing. Uh, and they learned it easily. And it was like you said, they, they hadn't yet been taught that you, you couldn't do that. Exactly. So yeah. what you're talking about, these... Um, these barriers falling down. These are barriers that are imposed by our own limiting thoughts. And I want to offer one more little um, little story that I think illustrates that uh, before we move on. Mm -hmm. um, the way elephants are trained in India, the way ba baby elephants are trained, oh, sure. there's a rope that's tied around their leg, a strong rope that's tied to a very solid post, and the baby elephant pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls and pulls until finally it figures out it cannot budge the post. Well, when the elephant becomes an adult elephant and obviously is strong enough to pull any post out of anywhere, all you have to do is tie the rope around their leg. The rope doesn't have to be tied to anything else. Mm -hmm. And the elephant knows, in quotation mark, right. knows that it cannot budge and stays in one place. So, you know, we would do well to ask ourselves, what are the... Um, invisible and perhaps not true beliefs that keep us tethered to a limited reality. Yeah. And, and you really have to start with, what if everything you know is wrong? Yeah. yeah you really do. The Fire Sign Theater had it right. Yeah, they did. <laughs> they really did. <laughs> well, you know, when I was younger and, and really starting to develop my uh, psychic skills, I came to realize that uh, my body was better at doing psychic stuff than I was, my mind was. So if I was looking for something, I would literally like just turn off my mind, start walking, and I would stop walking and look down, and literally what I was looking for was between my legs on the floor. Wow. And that happened numerous times. And that kind of brings me to the, the point of uh, uh, one of the big points you make in here and why you have Bruce Lipton as your co-writer, and that is that our cells are smarter than we are. Yeah. I mean, They're way you, smarter you, than we are. If we have a chapter in the book called Time to See a Good Shrink, and that's where we shrink ourselves down to the size of ourselves, and we go exploring in this amazing society that's created technologies that we can't even, we can't even approach. Yeah. Uh, we have the perfect heating and cooling system. We have the perfect sanitation system. We have a money system. We have a justice system, a political system in our bodies. And um, once you see, I have to say something about Bruce. Um, I, if you ever get a chance to go hear him in person, go hear Bruce. He's yeah. an amazing character. But when he was about eight years old, um, he got his first microscope. And uh, so he started looking at these cells under the microscope. And the first thought that came to him was, wow, those are little people. Hmm. So he already had this predisposition to seeing the uh, seeing these cells as sentient beings. But when you when you read that section in the book, you, you're just going to be totally blown away because um, our cells have an ex have this extraordinary intelligence, 
And, you know, we, we human beings tend to be arrogant. We put ourselves at the top of the food chain. And a little humility might, might do well here yeah. Yeah. Um, to, to begin to recognize that we could learn from ourselves just as we can learn from nature. If, if we could model our society uh, like the cells of our body, we'd have this whole thing figured out. Yeah, and I mean, you know, metaphors, are, you, know, you can only go so far with them, but, you know, the body has a very successful economy. Uh, ATP, adenosine triphosphate, is the called the coin of the realm, uh, and by um, taking on and releasing um, phosphorus molecules, energy is stored and transferred by the body. Now, every cell gets what it needs to thrive. So we call it no cell left behind. Mm. However, the cells that are doing the most work, the most important work for the survival of the entire system, um, they get paid more. Mm. They may even have a staff of cells working for them. So it's not quite a socialist organization. Not a social. It's not socialist. <laughs> but it's, um, it's um, a very uh, enlightened... Um, it's more of a meritocracy. It's a meritocracy. Yeah. And, and yet, uh, now, of course, there are, there are cells that go bad. And the cells that go bad are given a chance to rewrite. They're given a re- chance to rewrite their programs, and sometimes they do. If they don't, well, then uh, there is capital punishment. <laughs> um, there's uh, something called apoptosis which is when cells are chemically induced to commit suicide, or as we call it in the book, to cavork. (laughs) 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 A new word. (laughs) You know, you really made it when when your name is now a verb. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Oh, yes. Uh, He cavorked, unfortunately. Uh, (laughs) <laughs> that guy, uh, that friend of Bernie Madoff, obviously could work. Could we work. don't know how, but um, <laughs> anyway. So, so the point is that uh, the intelligence of the cell, and then you start to see, well, what what doesn't happen? Well, you know, there's no punishment. They don't have a punishment system. Uh-huh. You can imprison cells by um, essentially surrounding them. And uh, a lot of times uh, toxins are collected in, uh, in cysts and fatty deposits to keep them from spreading around. So they're imprisoned. Um, but, but they're not being punished. They're simply, it's simply that the rest of the healthy tissue is being protected. Hmm. You know, and people say, well, you know, if you believe in peace, uh, would you do away with our armed forces? And uh, my rhetorical question is, would you do away with the immune system? Yeah, right. So yeah. we need to have an immune system. We need to have a police force, but that has to be working on behalf of life, not on behalf of the predators like we have today. Right, right. Not on behalf of Halliburton. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I tell you, uh, Steve, this has been a fascinating conversation. I uh, highly recommend everybody run, run, not walk out to the store and get a copy of Spontaneous Evolution. Uh, you'll understand the universe better. You'll understand your body better. You'll understand how we can get from here to there. In fact, your uh, subtitle is Our Positive Future and a Way to Get There from Here. Um, you've got some great uh, tools to begin to understand how to embrace uh, this new edge science that's uh, sweeping upon us and uh, to live a life of interdependence uh, as much as independence. Well, thank you so much, uh, Zen, and um, I hope I look forward to uh, coming to Pittsburgh. Yeah, we should bring see... in the Swami next year, and also doing a program on spontaneous evolution and the That'd practical applications, which we're calling Heartland Security. Heartland Security, I yeah. love it. Steve Behrman, it's been a real pleasure. Thanks for speaking with us today. Thank you, Sven.